Hi guys, well it has been ages since I've done anything like this and ages since I've actually preached and just had a chance of communicating some amazing truths and uh, but it is so good to be with you via this medium and uh, what an amazing worship song we just listened to and uh, I honestly believe and trust that it touched your hearts deeply and prepared your hearts to receive what I believe is a very significant word at the time that we find ourselves in. The title of my message, in fact, I'm starting a series and I just feel a stirring in my spirit. I've, in the middle of a season of fasting, felt led of God into that, really led of the Father to separate the time and separate myself in a new way, in a fresh way. And uh, 
out of this has really begun to be birthed something that has been stirring in my spirit and looking forward to over the coming weeks, the coming season, unpacking that a lot more, both for myself and for us as a community. And I believe that God is going to truly impart something profound. But we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's help and assistance as we actually dive into this. Because without His supernatural revelation, without His anointing and His grace to actually reveal the depths and the mysteries of God, we actually don't end up really experiencing the fullness of the transformational purpose that He has through what He wants to impart to us. So let's just take a moment and invite Him right now. Lord, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to be together in this way. We want to thank you for your presence in the midst of everything that is going on. We want to thank you that you are seated on the throne, that this has not caught you by surprise, that you are not in panic, but you are truly sovereignly in control. Lord, we know you're not the author of destruction. You're not the author of sickness and disease. You're not the author of suffering in this way. But we know that you are the only one who is able to take and redeem out of the pain, out of all that we go through and bring forth something profound, beautiful, powerful and transformational. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you lead us into truth. You lead us into all the truth of your heart, your character, and the truth of your word that truly sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles with you, whether on your phone or tablet, I want to invite you just to join me as I read from Daniel chapter, chapter 3, verse 16 to 28. And I'm going to take a few moments just to read the story. You would be very familiar with it. Uh, it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And um, not as uh, Trudy, my wife, would uh, many times say, you know, uh, what was it, your shack, my shack, <laughs> and something like that. Anyway, jokes aside, um, let's read through this portion of scripture. And the title of my message, in fact, the title of the series is Furnace Faith. Having furnace faith versus having just favor faith. And as we read this portion, we pick it up in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression of his face changed towards Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can understand that they had had tremendous favor from the king uh, up until this point. But there came a, a crossing of the line. There was something in their positioning and their stand in obedience to God that actually placed them in a life-threatening situation. And you need to think about that. That sometimes doing the will of God actually costs us everything. Not the other way around. Many times we have a false understanding of His blessing and how it operates. We think, well, if I'm doing the will of God, if I'm obedient, well, <clears throat> it's just going to mean this overwhelming, incredible, uh, you know, uh, blessing, uh, unrestricted blessing and favor, yet we discover that Sadrach, Meshach and Abednego, because of being obedient, because of doing the will of God, they found themselves in exactly the opposite. We see that so much through scripture. We see that with so many of the prophets. We see that with Jesus himself. We see that with Paul, the apostle Paul, etc., etc. And so that's what I mean, that there is a place and there is a faith in God that goes beyond just having favor faith. The capacity to believe God merely for His favor and His blessing. I know that for me, in a time like this, I want to discover a faith that is so rooted, it is so grounded, it is rooted in the very king of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It is immovable and unshakable, and it is and will last for eternity. And so we discover the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he spoke, and Nebuchadnezzar was fuming because they refused to bow their knee to his statue. They refused to worship man. <clears throat> and he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor, 
upon me, who were in his army, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their, co in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's command, and uh, my apologies, I just lost <laughs> my point. Um, Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men, loose, walking around in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. Now we read that story and we think, yeah, isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? Jesus stepped right into the midst of that furnace and uh, therefore they could have great courage and confidence. But let me tell you that they didn't know what the actual outcome was going to be. And that's my point, is that they discovered something. They were rooted in something that was so transcended the challenge that they faced. It was immovable and unshakable. It is what I call furnace faith. Faith. And if we pick up in verse 16, the few verses before, I want to track back to that. And we read that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We have no need to give you a justification, an explanation. <clears throat> we have no need to be intimidated, to bow our knee. But we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And He will deliver us from your hand, O King. He will, whether through death or through a miracle. Either way, our God is going to deliver us. That was their position. That was their standing. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Wow! If you really think of the story, this narrative in its context, I don't know about you, but my goodness, I reckon that my knees would be having lots of fellowship. I don't know if I'm at that place where I would have such a level of conviction, such a level of faith, such a rootedness, such a strength that I could look at the face of the king who can literally determine whether I'm going to live or die and stand my ground and say, our God is more than able. But even if he chooses not to deliver us, we still will not bow our knee. We will not stop praising you. We will not stop worshipping the God of all gods. We will not stop exalting Him. And I call this furnace faith. See, I think much of Christianity today has had such a focus on favor faith. Let's believe God. Let's have the faith for His favor, His blessings. It sounds wonderful. But how did that look like for many of the early church martyrs? How did that look like? For those who have been raised up and have served God in communist nations, history is there. How did that look like for those who came through the Middle Ages? How does that look like for you right now? How does that look like for me? Merely having favor faith. Merely having a capacity to believe God for His goodness and His blessing, but not have the capacity to find a depth of belief, a depth of conviction that causes me to tap into the unshakable reality of the kingdom that we are partakers of. In fact, I believe that's where it transcends from going from faith in God to the faith of God. The gift that He gives us. 
discovering that profound truth. So over the coming weeks, I want to unpack that a little. And I want us to understand the process. Because I think that's where it falls down. I know my wrestle was around the fact that I could not understand why God let certain things happen. And many times, what He was doing in the midst of it. And I think that's why my own faith got shaken. My own positioning got shaken. I remained in a place, often just at a surface level, and failed to embrace the profound transformational maturing process that He actually intends to take us through for the sake of His glory, for the sake of His purpose, for the sake of His mandate. Fairness faith versus favor faith. You see, in reality, He has already given you that seed of faith. The seed is of Him. That seed of faith is of Him. So in essence, it's His faith that He has given to us. How do we now unlock its potential? <clears throat> because the truth of the matter is, is that really we're already favored. We are already blessed. So why do I need faith to access what already is mine? What already is yours? No, I need faith to be able to be rooted in the midst of the furnace. I need faith to be immovable and unshakable in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of when everything is falling apart. And that's really my question. I wrote down in my own notes, what do I do when everything falls apart? I was thinking about the COVID-19 crisis and thinking about some perspectives around it. I know there's a lot being said right now. There's a lot from a faith perspective, from a God perspective, from a human perspective. And there are a lot of voices. But one thing I haven't heard much of is really what I call context. The right perception around what's really going on. And I think we need as believers to have the right context. And actually have it framed a little differently. Just for example, what did it look like for the generation that was born in 1900? Those that were born in 1900, within the first 45 years of their lives, on a global scale, those who were born in 1900 experienced the following. First and foremost, the First World War. Devastating. Out of the First World War, the Spanish flu that literally became a global pandemic in dimensions that far exceeds what we're experiencing right now. As if that wasn't enough, straight from the Spanish flu into the Great Depression. And from the Great Depression, straight into the Second World War, which finished in 1945. So you, can you imagine if you were born in 1900, at the age of 16, the First World War started. You're full of hope and anticipation and expectation of an amazing future, especially as a believer. By the time you're 18, 19, the world has experienced a devastating global war. And you think, okay, the war's over. Now I have a hope in the future. And it went on. Not just for a year. Not for two years. For a decade after decade after decade. And I cannot imagine coming out of all of that and at the age of 45 years of age, I would have experienced two world wars. I would have experienced a global pandemic, pandemic and I would have experienced a financial economic collapse that reshaped the world. How do I have a faith in God and the faith of God that keeps me immovable and unshakable through that. It's a lifetime. That's a lifetime. And yet, when we read the annals of history, we discover that it was the men and women of faith, the men and women of the kingdom that shone during that period of time. It's profound 
All you have to do is do a little research and you will discover some of the greatest revelations, greatest moves of God, greatest positioning and influence from a kingdom perspective happened during that season. How much more for us right now? But what do I do when everything falls apart? There have been times in the last weeks, the last months actually, that Trudy and I have felt like that. I'll be honest with you, there were days where I wanted to crawl up in a ball in the corner. There were nights that I've cried out to God that I have not been able to sleep through. Panic has been crouching at the door. Anxiety wanting to overwhelm me. And that's the way you might be feeling right now. You might be feeling overwhelmed. You might be feeling anxious and full of fear and anxiety. You might have a sense of hopelessness. You've lost your job. You've lost your business. That's some of the things that we're facing. Trudy and I are in some of those challenges right now. We don't have solutions. We don't have enough answers for some of the things we're facing. But we have God. We have God. And we know that the truth is, is that beyond and above and transcended over this whole situation, He is ultimately going to cause it to work for the good. And that's where I want to close a little later. But a few other things. I mean, what I discovered and what I have discovered over the last weeks and months through everything and the challenges I've had to face and to work through, loss and grief and many of you know what's happened over the last six months. But the one thing that I can say is that I got confronted with my fragility. How fragile we really are. How fragile we are as human beings. How fragile we are in our own strength. Notice I said, in our own strength. And I needed to be confronted with that. I needed to be confronted with just the level of fragility, the level of insecurity, the level of my weakness. It needed to be exposed. It needed to be brought to the light. Otherwise, it can never become light. There have been times where I have felt trapped in my pain. Pardon me, <clears throat> getting a little emotional. <laughs> but I felt trapped in where I've been and haven't known how am I going to move past this? How am I going to get beyond where I am right now? And why did I feel like that? Because I've realized that what I didn't see was in the midst of the pain how God was actually at work. And that's part of what I want to share as we unpack this journey. As we look over the following weeks about what is God really up to? Do we understand what He is doing at a very, very deep level? At an unseen level? At an eternal level? We're so wrapped up in the temporal. We're so wrapped up in the immediate. We get so caught up with our dreams in reality and, and seeing it fulfilled and you know in the short term we sometimes forget that there is a plan and purpose that transcends it all if our lives are truly rooted in him we can know that he is in control yes it has caused me to feel powerless oh my goodness <laughs> Whew. I mean I just think of even just, you know, as little as two, three, four weeks ago. When this all hit and we had to shut down things and we had to work through staffing and we, ah, it was, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And I felt deep down in my being, I felt powerless. I felt powerless. I had to find a place of peace in God. I had to find a place in Him. And I'm still finding that place. I'm still growing. And that's part of what we want to unpack and, and uh, discover. Because what I discovered is that part of the anxiety was that I couldn't see how God could actually use this to do something profound and transformational. T.D. Jakes has uh, recently published a book. And I think, wow, the timing is just incredible. And it's actually called Crush It. And he tackles the subject and he talks about his own story. He talks about his own journey. You know, we, we, see, we see the picture of a successful preacher and entrepreneur and movie producer and business owner and, and uh, amazing guy 
on the outside. But he begins to share his own journey. And he said sometimes where some of those greatest blessings were happening, he was literally at his lowest points in his life. That internally he was in a place of such crushing that he lost all sense of clarity around his purpose moving forward. Filled with fear and anxiety. Wrecked and, you know, filled with... I mean, you think of that, wow, he's a giant, a general in the faith, and he's a giant in God. But you know what you discover is that any person that God is going to use in a profound way has to grow through, go through what he defines as crushing. Because really, unless a grape is crushed, unless grapes are crushed, there is no wine. Unless wheat kernels are ground literally into dust, there is no bread. And isn't that ultimately what God wants to bring forth? He wants to bring forth His wine in and through our lives. He wants to bring forth His bread in and through our lives. So that the nations may taste and see the goodness of our God. And I realized as I've been wrestling through this, that there is something in God that transcends a process in the journey that is truly, truly a deep, deep encouragement in the midst of the pain. And I want to pick up actually from what T.D. Jakes writes in his book on crushing. And he says the following is one cannot exist without the other, meaning my pain and what I'm going through and what if everything falls apart and my struggle and all this wrestling cannot exist without also knowing and seeing that at the same time, God does unexpected things. Supernatural blessing. Why? Because at the same time, he says, this is true for you and for me. <coughs> Pardon me. On one hand, God's purpose is requiring you and I to step boldly into our futures. On the other hand, sits the crushing of the accomplishments of our lives that we have worked and toiled so tirelessly to produce. Wow, I mean, that's literally the way I know Trudy and I felt. We have put so much into something over the last season and believed so strongly that this is what God has led us to do. And the prayer and the intercession and the financial commitment and everything we possibly could do. And it just seemed the opposite was being coming forth. And still seems like that. But to realize that this play, as he writes, this play between those two that compels me to actually have that conversation, that conversation with God. Is it possible? T.D. Jakes states. He said, is it possible? Maybe even a prerequisite that each person who dares to embrace their future is also called to endure a season of trial and pain. I think of Trudy's message from last week. Consider it pure joy. I was so proud of her. Wow, blew me away. That in the midst of what she's going through, she brought forth a word like that. And with such courage and boldness, shared the truth of God. While we endure the season of pain, what if there is more to our sufferings than we see? What if the disquieting and dreadful places of life often move us along from one stage to the next, a catalyst for our growth unlike any other. No, now, now more than ever, it's crucial that we begin seeing that the plans we have imagined for our lives cannot compare. Notice what he says, that the plans we have imagined for our lives cannot compare to God's strategy for fulfilling our divine purpose. Wow. Wow. Once accepted and acted upon, this line of thinking causes a massive shift in our perceptions, in our decisions, and in our behavior. We finally realize that we have been thinking too small in contrast to a God whose end game for our destinies focuses on eternity 
instead of something temporary. We sprint to win the race we perceived we're running. Well, oh, I'm so guilty of that. Boy, have I sprinted. Have I tried to make things happen? Have I tried to force things to happen? Have I pushed? Have I wrestled? We sprint to win the race. We perceive we're running. But instead, God is training us for the Master's Marathon. I believe that that was such a key for the Apostle Paul. That's why he could write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Let me read it to you, especially out of the Amplified. He says, Therefore we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted and wearied out through fear, though our outer man and all of these things are progressively decaying and seem like they're wasting away. Yet, in the midst of this, our inner self is being progressively renewed and transformed day after day. For our light, momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. Beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast and transcendent glory. It's working for us. A vast and transcendent glory and blessedness that is never to cease. What did the Apostle Paul tap into? What did he understand in the process of crushing, in the process of pain? What did he understand in the midst of it that allowed him to write these verses with such bold courage and say, God is actually, these things are actually working for us. That God is using these things to work for us a transcendent weight of glory. Romans 8, 28, which many of us are familiar with. He again shares the same thought along similar lines. And he says, for it is important for us to understand that we are assured and know this truth. That all things work together for the good. He didn't say all things are good. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, I mean... It would be amazing if all things were good. But the truth of the matter is, is Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, verse 33, his own words, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. In this world, sorry, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I will overcome the world. Back to that portion of scripture that Paul writes in verse 28 of Romans chapter 8. And as he states, he says, for this is the assurance, this is the knowledge that we carry deep within us, that all things work together and are fitting, fitting us for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. In closing, I want to leave you with these three imperative unshakable truths. Number one is it is so critical to understand that God has got this. God has got this. Number two is to understand that God has got you. Yes, and everything that concerns you. He's got it. He's got you in His hands. In His hands, the scripture says, nothing can pluck you out. Nothing can pluck you out of His hands. God has got this. God has got you in His hands. And number three is that goodness and greatness, the reality of His glory, will actually come out of this. How it looks like, what exactly it looks like, that is in God's hands. And so as I close, this part one of Furnace Faith, I trust that you are encouraged that you are feeling built up in the midst of the storm. We're not living in denial and saying there is no fear, there's no anxiety, there's no huge questions. 
As I said, I know many of you and some of you have lost your jobs, you're having to close businesses, you are facing liquidation. Um, there are challenges that we have not experienced globally, certainly in our lifetime. But in the midst of this, God is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He has got this. He has got you. And great goodness and transformation will come out of this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your incredible love and your grace towards us. You don't condemn us for feeling overwhelmed. You don't criticize and judge us for feeling swamped with anxiety and fear. But you meet with us in the furnace. The fourth man. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, I thank you that you are the fourth man in the furnace. And that man looked like the very Son of God. And I thank you that you are with us in the midst of this. And that you are doing a work that only time and eternity will tell. That there is a weight of glory that is going to be worked out and worked through and worked upon us through this season. We rejoice in you. We love you. And we thank you that you have got this and that you have got us in jesus name amen love you guys look forward to actually continuing this journey as we unpack some of these amazing truths have an awesome week be encouraged bless you Truly.
that's all that it needs. Thank you for that holy night. Thank you, Father, that you sent your son, that a child was given unto us so that we can have a saviour, someone who can just love us unconditionally. Thank you, Jesus, for loving you. 